Ido has a PowerPoint that he has used in other presentations and as we discuss, which by the way, Ido Benzivi, everybody, give him a hand. This works for you. Okay, so by the way, for those of you that you know, say, wow, I really liked, I, I missed what Ido said or I, I didn't hear what Lance was saying, uh, Michael Tukes, which by the way, if anybody's looking for a good videographer, Michael Tukes, go grab him after, after the meeting and give him his card. And it will, we will um, um, put the video online, we'll get it posted out to everybody so you guys can go home and watch this over and over and over and over because it's going to be so great. So uh, this is the, I'm actually going to give the clicker to Ito. Um, we briefly talked about, hey, let's take a few minutes and talk about which one of these slides might be interesting to you. But before we get into that, I just wanted to give Ito a few minutes, whether it's two minutes or he takes ten, just to kind of say, hey, this, for those of you that aren't really familiar with who he is and what he's all about and what he means to the Inland Empire as it relates to our business, um, give him like a little opportunity to do a self-introduction. Um, and we are going to have a lot of opportunity, unlike the market forecast. Who has questions for Ito? One of you? Two of you? Okay, well, hopefully the rest of you won't be so shy. But we are going to give um, a, a, a true opportunity for you guys to go ahead and, and, and ask some questions and say, hey, whether you're interested in the residential or the commercial side or, of course, you know, the logistics center, which is what most of us are kind of familiar with Edo and the Inland Empire, what he's been doing out on the east end of Marino Valley and some of his other projects. So, Well, thank you. Uh, it's, it's good to be here. How many people were stuck in traffic this morning? Mm. Yeah, it was I incredible. Somebody remind me I was in some conference and there was supposed to be a thousand people there and we were there and there was 20 people. Right. And the guy started the presentation and says I was caught in the same traffic and he said I was wondering what happened on the freeway and he says I turned on the news and it, it turns out that all that commotion on the freeway was some lady was giving birth oh. on the freeway. Who gave he birth said, on the freeway He said that morning. wasn't the amazing part the amazing part was that she wasn't pregnant when she got on the freeway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Welcome to Southern California. Welcome to Southern California. <laughs> so uh, a little bit about myself. My name is Ido Benzivi. I have a company called Highland Fairview. Uh, we specialize in large scale real estate, whether industrial, commercial, hospitals, hospitality, things of that nature. Out here, uh, people in the east part of the Inland Empire, the western part, now it's all kind of converging sort of know us for some big projects in Moreno Valley, one uh, building that most people seem to know if you ever drive towards Palm Springs, eastward on the 60s, you see a building has sketches on it. Uh, that's one of the buildings we build and least to sketches. Uh, what was significant about the building at the time, it was, still is, I think, the largest of its kind, but more importantly, it's the world's largest Leeds Gold certified building. How many people know what Leeds are, is? So it's yeah, yeah. Take a minute and, and tell them about. So the what US GBC US uh, Green Building, uh, it's an independent organization that basically sets standards for sustainable development, especially buildings, and uh, they have leads, and then they have lead silver, and they leave gold. Now they have platinum, and uh, essentially they're independent. You don't get to talk to them. They come evaluate your building, and after they evaluate your building, they spend a year monitoring it. And if it all checks out, they give you the certification. So it's a very, very stringent process. But essentially what it uh, ensures is that the building has a certain level of sustainability and gold is pretty high. So the reason I say that, it's not that easy to do 81 million cubic feet of space and be Leeds Gold. In fact, it is so efficient that you will spend more money this summer air conditioning your house than that building ever will. Wow. In fact, that's so, so, so the gist of the LEED certification is literally an environmentally friendly, environmentally energy efficient. Uh, everything, I mean, I wouldn't suggest you eat the paint off the building, but it's non-toxic. There's a lot of issues that, that go along with getting that level of certification. It is important because a lot of people look at industrial space and sort of correlate it with trucks or pollution or you know, impacts to the environment. And here is a large industrial facility that actually has the highest environmental standards in the county. I'm not familiar with any other building that sleeps gold in Riverside County, right. other than maybe some small office space or a smaller building, but right. and any large scale building. It's Who, the who's ever even heard of this LEED certificate? And it's L E E D S, yeah. correct? Okay, just, so just a few of you. I, I, got it. I had never heard of it until Ito had mentioned it, I think, a few years ago. And, 
And obviously, we are in a world right now which is every day more environmentally um, um, conscious and friendly, and that's a good thing. Um, but I think the only other building that I've been in that I was aware of that I saw the leads, and I was just in it recently, I was in New Jersey at the Realogy building, which Realogy is the parent company for Cobalt Banker and C21 and ERA and a few others. And they have one of those plaques on the building, I think it was, but it wasn't gold. I think they got the silver or something like that. So um, at any rate, so let me, I wanna back up just a second though. So it costs more in electric to power my house than it does to power, is that what I heard you say? Yeah, so you will actually spend more money this summer air conditioning your house than that building ever will, 1.8 million square feet. And that's because I am assuming that your house is not 100% solar. It is 0% solar. Okay, well, so. that building powers has about 280,000 square feet of solar facilities on the roof. And it's, so it's basically self-sustaining as it relates it's to essentially electric. self-sustaining. There's a lot of other elements into it, and I don't want to turn our conversation into right. the, the science, but we had to develop six different technologies and get six innovation credits out of Leeds in order to be able to do a building of this size and get that kind of level of sustainability. Right. So you know, in another conversation, those who are interested, it's actually a fascinating, and it's really very timely because you hear about you know, all the issues that we have in Southern California and the world, you know, the, the Paris, you know, Accord, you know, the, the global warming, all of those things really tie back into, you know, sustainability and, right. and making sure that when we do development, we impact the environment the least as possible. And now we're talking about literally zero impacts. Right. So. Well, we're going to talk about rents and impact on commercial rents and such. Right. So I'm going to assume that if I'm the Skechers tenant and I now in effect have no electric bill, but I'm probably paying a little bit more in rent for that building than I otherwise would. Well, so here's the key. So the rent actually was a lot higher than market. And people say, why would a tenant pay you literally almost twice market rent? So why would, and that's because the savings offset far more than the rent right. differential. So sketches, according to the reporting, saving millions of dollars a year in operating costs being in this building right. compared to conventional building. Right. So, you know, if you do it right, it has environmental benefit, but it also has real tangible economic benefits to do that. Right. So if it's configured right, not always easy to do, but when you do, it can be a win-win both for the environment and, and business. Interesting. So. Again, who attended our market forecast last year, year before, in any year? Okay, probably most of you in this room. That's more than likely why you're here because, you know, we had a snafu with Ido in March. Um, I don't know who presents the chart. Maybe it's Chris or John Husing or whatever it happens to be. But I have a, this memory of looking at a chart that talks about the, the utility costs in California compared to the utility costs, let's say, in Texas. So it seems like these type of buildings, even though I'm sure they're a lot more expensive to, to, to build and, and, and you know, construct um, over the long term, Sounds like that might be a solution to some of our utility costs. Yeah, so, so. Uh, sure, uh, you know, especially in commercial real estate, right? Uh, people might buy a home because they love the location, they love the schools, they love the house, uh, they're willing to buy a certain lifestyle. But commercial operators look at total cost of occupancy. Right. They want to know what does it cost me to operate in this location. California is an expensive state. So to offset and compete, you must, you must have much more efficient facilities or other drivers that offset the extra cost. You know, we're high, ta you know, taxes are high in California. Uh, we call it the, the weather tax, right? You wanna live in this great weather, you pay a tax to, to be able to live in this environment. So, you know, you have to be more creative in developing facilities, especially for industry. You know, how many people, when was the last time you had a large industry m moving into California? Exactly. And it, yeah. Right. You kind of hear about people living in California. Yep. So it's a challenge to retain people, even attract new people. So every time you see it happen, you have to really understand that somebody worked really hard, very creatively to ensure that that can happen here. You know, the costs in California are, are very high. But on the other hand, there's a lot of benefits here. You know, there's a big market. You know, if you take Southern California as an independent nation, you take, you know, from LA to San Diego in an empire, and you stick a flag to it and you say that's an independent nation, depending on what year it is, it could be anywhere from seventh to ninth largest economy in the world. In the world, itself. right. 
So it's a huge economy. And you know, if you want to participate in this economy, you have to be here. So, right. so in, those, in, in California, I don't want to put you on the spot, but in California as a state is ranks fifth, seventh. Right. You know, it depends again who has a recession, what's going on. Right. But it's one of the ten largest economies in the world. Right. So, um, in any event, so you know, why is it important? Because selling homes, right? One of the biggest determinant is job creation. So we have the World Logistics Center. We're going to create about 13,500 construction jobs over years, as well as 20,000 permanent jobs. So what happens in the Moreno Valley area, Riverside, Paris, San Jacinto, Redlands, when you have 20,000 jobs and you have employers opening up and saying we're hiring? And then the question is, what kind of jobs? So in some industries, those who oppose it you know, put out a lot of misnomers. For example, they tell you, you know, in the logistics industry, all low paying jobs. The fact of the matter is, uh, it's about forty-three to $45,000 median wage. And if you have a dual house income and you're making about $90,000, dollars uh, that's pretty good income to afford almost any house right. in the moment of value in other areas. So these are family lifestyle supporting jobs. And they're not just jobs, they're careers, because if you look at the upward mobility in that industry, it's fantastic. Um, in fact, uh, somebody told me the other day ago, I was in some conference with someone from UPS, and if now he's one of the you know, senior financial, I, I was, I was executive vice president, he started out as a delivery guy. Right. So there's a tremendous amount of upper mobility, which is good because it's not dead end jobs, it's actually careers where if you improve yourself, you can move on. And some people like uh, at those buildings you see make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year as well as people are all the way down to being groundskeepers and security guards and so forth. So it's really jobs for everybody, but as it relates to housing, can you imagine creating 33,000 jobs in Moreno Valley? What does that do to housing? I don't care if you're renting an apartment yep. or you're buying a home, right? It's an opportunity to sell. And to your point with the inventory, what happens when you have 20,000 people show up in the area and there's no home? Yep. What happens to prices, right? And what happens when prices go up? All of a sudden, development can start to occur because if land was too expensive, because you can't quite get there, and you have the demand and it's pushing up prices. So I say, not to you, you guys all know it, but the residential market is local, it's not national. There's no such thing as the, you, know, you look at charts, and I'm glad you're showing our area because right. you know, somebody looking for a home in the Inland Empire is, doesn't care what the housing market is in Orlando, Florida. Right, or, right? or, or Newport Beach for that matter. Or Newport Beach. So right. it's very localized. So if we create tens of thousands of jobs in our local market, it has a direct impact on housing. And then it starts to multiply. You buy housing, you're buying furniture, the furniture store does better, uh, they go buy a house. You know, it all is the multiplier. You know, you sell more homes, you make more money, you decide to buy a new car. All of those things starts to create a multiplier effect within our economy and it, it really creates an exponential, right. you know. Uh, so I think it's all good. And I think uh, it's up to you and the timing, but I had a few slides. Yeah, to kind of show well, you, you know where they're at. So pop, pop okay. you can go through and, and skip sure. through them and find the ones that you think are appropriate for the group. And, uh, but before you do that, just because I don't know how much time we're going to spend on the Logistics Center, but I, there's a couple questions I had specifically on. When did you actually, when did you have the idea that said, hey, I, I, I maybe you already own some property on the East End. But you know, there's a lot of rumor. And by the, by the way, for those of you guys that have followed Edo, I Edo came into my radar. I don't know, eight years ago, seven years ago. I don't know. And then if you followed the politics as it relates to the World Logistics Center and what's going on in Moreno Valley, a lot of ugliness, a lot of nastiness. Um, but putting all that aside, because I don't think any of us really want to talk about that today. Um, when, when did the when did you have this vision that said, hmm? This looks like a good place for me to invest, start acquiring additional properties, and, um, and basically you know, have this idea that I'm going to do this World Logistics Center. When, when did that come to fruition? Or when did that seed right, so, uh, take root? That's around 2004. OK, uh, so we're talking 14 years ago. Yeah. So it's a good thing that we were young when we started. But if uh, you know, the closest I'll ever get to eternal life is going through the CEQA entitlement process. In right. And we're going to talk about CEQA right. in a so, little bit, because it's yeah, so much fun to talk about CEQA. It takes years to just get through the process. And like in every community, you know, there's, especially in today's world of the internet, where you know, untruth or lies 
or fake news have the same level of credibility as real news, right? You go to the internet, you read something. There is no sorting mechanism that tells you what is true and what is not. So you're reading anything on blogs, you're reading anything on Facebooks, you know, in a community, and they can make up anything they want, right? And all of a sudden, you can't really sort out what is right. real, what is not. And usually people are busy in their life, positive people, they're not out there playing around, making up stories. And so what's left really is, is one-sided arguments about those who necessarily are motivated to oppose something. You know, and there, there's lots of reasons that people are, have a passion for the environment, and it doesn't matter, you know, it's sort of like a religion. For those who believe, no explanation is necessary, and for those who don't believe, no explanation will do. Right. So those folks you can't really talk to because they have their view of the world, and th that's what it is. So, but let me, let me go back to the 2004, because this is where I was going with that. So um, I'm trying to put myself in your shoes, and I'm saying, okay, I've got this, this vision of, of creating this logistics center um, in 14 years ago. So I tend to be, as I'm doing my business planning, okay, what would be the best case scenario? If I started this in 2004, when would this project be started? And, and it may never be completed in your lifetime, but I would imagine you know, 14 years ago, you kind of thought you would be at certain points at certain times. Are you anywhere close to where you thought you would be uh, well, in 2004? Uh, or is, is, is well, just the whole to, process? It's hard to project, but right. if you come into it open eye and you realize that large scale projects in California take an average of 10 years to get through, which is beyond what it really should be, right? because it impacts all of us, the economy. Those jobs that could have been here 10 years ago will arrive 10 years later. Right. And that has a lot of impact. Think about just simply people who commute, you know, in Moreno Valley, for example, 90% of the population com commute out of town for jobs, yep. an average of 76 minutes, right? That's a lot of time on the freeway. And how do we know that? Because, right? We were you, there the, this the, morning. You look, at the, yeah. <laughs> you look at the government statistics, right? The, the government knows where you live and where you pick up your paycheck. So they know how far you're going to get to work. That's horrendous. If you calculate it out, and I have a little slide to show, yep. kind of see what, what that means has impact on a lot of people's lives, and nothing really changes. So we have a process in California that takes a long time, and at the end of the day, you know, we were sued under SQL for sketches. It took four and a half years to get through the entitlement process, and we built the building in eight and a half months. So it took right. longer to push the paperwork around than to actually build the building. Yeah, four or five times longer. And now that it's built, I don't know how many people drive around there or know the area, but you come to Moreno Valley. I drive by it at least once a week. Right, nobody's disturbed, right. right? There's no pollution, there's no big traffic, right? But yet if you're hurt, right, all the commotion leading up to it, right. you start to understanding why those sort of things and why good people don't get involved uh, causes these huge impacts to all of us in California. And I hope some, you know, in each of your communities you get involved because it does make a difference. And at the end of the day, in Moreno Valley, despite all the commotion and all the noise and all the you know, stories they tell, and you know, sometimes it's funny, people come and show me what they say about me. So they, the people have my whole life history, and I say, I don't even recognize who that person is. So the last thing I saw is my biography, born in, in Israel, which I was, grew up in Egypt. Now, again, when you don't know anything, it sounds okay, except if you know the Middle East, there's no way if I was born in Israel I can go up in Egypt, right? right? I wouldn't make it to be one year old. In those days, it wasn't a, right. wasn't, it's a little bit different today. But the point is, you just make up stuff and people read it and say, okay, it makes sense to me. When Putin was coming into the news, all the workers were saying, he speaks Russian and he's a friend of Putin. Never met him in my life, I have no idea how what that, but you see, that's what I mean. You get that going on. Oh, but you, when you got people, caught up in the Russian scandal? I must have missed that one. It doesn't matter. There's, there's oh. all these stories going on. Somebody he speaks should make, Russian. Oh, my of course. Gracious. So the, the point is that it's just il illustrative that if people don't get involved in the community on the positive side, right. uh, it tends to gravitate to where it may stop a lot of things that could very well be very beneficial to a community, but you right. never know. They will never had the chance to, to, to come out. So we had a big... You know, community outreach, we spoke to about 20,000 people in Moreno Valley, actually 27,000. And, and the day of the hearing, we had about 500 people there in support. Right. And there were about 50, 70 people against. 
Do you think part of your challenge was that you were the, like the first building in that location and therefore because you were the first and um, you just kind of got the extra heat? Because if you're familiar with the area Ito's talking about, you know, Aldi, the, the food guys, they put up a building. I'm assuming they had some trouble, but if they did, it wasn't in the news a whole hell of a lot. Um, there's, new, there's new construction going on right now. If you've driven through there, it's amazing, which by the way, if you haven't driven down the 60 um, east going towards Palm Springs before you get to the Skechers plant, that vacant lot in between Skechers and Aldi and where the fire station is, who's, who hasn't driven by there in the last three, four months? Well, next time you drive by there, you better drive by quickly because there's gonna be I don't know, it looks like a half a dozen buildings that are going up and millions of square foot of space. Um, I, I, I drive by it all the time. I have a business in Marino Valley. If they had a hard time getting that done, I must have fell asleep that week. Um, now, you might tell me, wait a minute, Lance, they've been working on that for 10 years. They have. Uh, yeah, okay, so they have, right. So at any rate, let, let's, let, me, let me give you back the control okay. of the clicker here and, 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 and show us what you've got on your PowerPoint that you might find interesting. So for us. I thought of maybe talking about, you know, why logistics and what does it all mean and why is it important for our area? Because the number one job, with, you know, the number one industry in our region is logistics. And it produces the, by far the, you know, the largest number of jobs yep. and will continue to do so. And most people don't understand why. What is it all about? They think it's a warehouse and a truck but or making you know, some products, you know, get the product to you, and you, know, you get the oversimplified right. notions of what this is all about. So I want to talk to you about why our area, why it's important for our area, why it will continue to be important for our area, and what does that actually mean, and why I think people should be more aware of what it does. So, so <laughs> this is a quote from Mark Twain. So what Mark Twain said, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble, what you know for sure that ain't so. Right. So a lot of people think they know what it's about, and they have, uh, you know, they think they understand what it's about, but it's not exactly that. So why is trade or logistics, which is the underlying infrastructure for, for uh, a global trade, why is it important? Because the U.S. government estimates that our GDP needs to get to about $22 trillion by 2025 in order for us to be sort of a sustainable economy, meaning we have enough jobs for everybody, everybody's full employment, they're working, uh, the government generates enough revenue to provide the services we want, our fire and police and you know, pensions and, and social security and so forth. So we need to be at $25 trillion by 2025, but it's predicated on our GDP where 60% is gonna be derived from global trade. And the underlying infrastructure for that is logistics. If we don't have an efficient, robust, advanced, logistics infrastructure, we will be lagging. And it's hard to build in pace. So when we realize that our livelihood, our ability for our country to be sustainable, for our government to pay social security and, and pensions and you know, all of the things we, we uh, like to see the government provide for us, as well as our own jobs and a sustainable economy, we gotta get this right, right? It's like saying, we're not gonna have roads, but we wanna sell cars. If you don't have the roads, you won't be able to sell cars. If we don't have a logistics infrastructure to make us globally competitive in the United States, we won't be able to get more than half of our GDP will be derived from you know, trade, which is logistics. And just in our corner of the world, there's over $2 trillion of trade coming into Southern California, what we call the Golden Triangle. And the ports of LA and Long Beach uh, are expected by 2030, it's not that far away from now, to get up to 42 million TEUs. TEUs is container equivalent. So that, that's a lot of containers coming into our, our region. In fact, nearly half of all goods coming in the United States come through the ports of LA Long Beach. So it's a very important area. And all of it is coming to sort of this Southern California Golden Triangle, right? LA to San Diego, the Inland Empire. And this region, as we said, if it was an independent nation, would be one of the largest economies in the world in and of itself. So to your question, why we came here, right? right? So if you understand how products are made, and you understand the dynamics in the United States, our strategy was to take major positions in the major markets. So we have things going in the East Coast and the West Coast uh, in you know, specific industries. So there's the port, and, and when people ask why the World Logistics Center where we are, it's because we have direct link where we need, within an hour's drive of every major market in Southern California, LA, Orange County, San Diego, and within the Inland Empire, and to the ports. So we get to LA, 
Orange County, San Diego, Mexico, which is important because we have half a trillion dollars of trade coming in from Mexico. Just at the border, not in Tijuana, but Mexicali, we have over 300,000 trucks crossing. The Anybody been to Mexicali lately? It's amazing. Um, Drew and Drake and myself go down and we do the Baja every now and then. If you haven't driven through Mexicali recently, the amount of new construction and buildings and aerospace and all that was, wait a minute, all the American jobs going down there. I don't want to get into that. All I know is the stuff that's going on in Mexicali right now is incredible. Um, matter of fact, I think there's a part of Mexicali called New Mexicali, which is, it, it might, if you haven't been there and you have an impression of what you know, Mexicali might have looked like or what it looked like 20 years ago, I can tell you it doesn't look like that today. It, it, it looks like a new city um, with a tremendous amount of industrial um, capacity and, and right. economy. And if we get all our policies right, Mexico is very important for us. It's a huge trading partner. We have that and Canada. But the stronger Mexico gets, the bigger market it is, the better we do. We have more products we can sell to Mexico, more things we can buy from Mexico, and they're right next door. Right. You don't have to ship it from all over the world, right? So it's very important that we get that right. So we didn't, you know, we're an hour's drive of a very major market in Southern California, which is very important, including Mexico, but we're within the overnight tracking to the 11 Western states. And why that's important is if you look at, at uh, the Western states in blue, so we're within 12 hours overnight to a $4.3 trillion GDP. And we're within 24 hours, when you get to the rest of America, of a $7.5 trillion GDP. And of course, the rest of America it's about $18 trillion GDP. So what does that mean to be within overnight tracking to the 11 Western states? So the largest economy in the world is the US at 18 trillion. Then we have China at 11 trillion, then Japan at 4 trillion. So what does it mean that we're within the overnight tracking distance to a $4.5 trillion GDP? So if you place that in the world economy, we're within overnight tracking to the 11 Western states, $4.5 trillion GDP, it's the third largest economy in the world. So imagine Southern California, Gone Triangle, within an hour's drive of every major market in that market, which is, let's say, the seventh largest economy in the world, and we're within overnight tracking, right, next day delivery, to the third largest economy in the world, never mind that we're within the largest economy in the world, the United States. So when people ask why here, why the World Logistics Center, you start to see why we're here, right. why the strategy was, was here. But it's not just that it's located next to the port, but the way the global economy works and transportation infrastructure work, it's also the fastest way to get to the US market. And so if you're moving from Shanghai to New York, going through this golden triangle is five days faster than any other means, Panama Canal, any other way you do it. Uh, if you're going to Houston, it's 13 days. And why is this important? Because time is money. Imagine if you're a company like a Walmart that has a billion dollars of inventory floating, coming. And it takes you an extra two weeks to get there. What happens in two weeks? Not only does the inventory cost you money, but what happens for two weeks when the stuff is not on your shelves? Your competitor is selling it, right? So speed to market is very important. Southern California pro provides the fastest gateway to the US market. So that's why you see all of this going on in our region and in Southern California. And why is that? Because take a typical product, let's say a laptop, doesn't matter what brand it is. This is how many countries are involved in making the components to a laptop, right? So when people say it's made in China, it's really not made in China, maybe assembled in China, but it's really made by the world, and right. that's logistics. And this is one of the products, and I won't get into much of it, but this is all the interrelationship. For example, when you make an iPhone, Apple makes an iPhone, they procure components from 776 global suppliers. Each one of them makes several components. So you can imagine how many suppliers have to come together in order to make a product like an iPhone. And all of that requires robust supply chain management and a robust you know, logistics infrastructure, like we see here. And part of what we're doing is to try to make this thing more efficient because in logistics, the, if you touch something more than once, right, the price goes up. And if you have to have more movements together, the price goes up, right? And the number one cost in logistics is transportation, right? That's by far 70% of the cost. 
He said that the, the distribution center, the warehouse, the employees, the rent, the cost of operating it is 30%. Transportation is 70%. So to make it more efficient. So what is this? If you look at major suppliers and major riders, so let's, let's assume like a Best Buy. You, you're getting stuff from Samsung. You're getting stuff from Panasonic. You're getting stuff from Apple. You have to bring it all to the warehouse, right, and then distribute it to, to your stores or to your other vendors. So essentially, if you take what's on the ground and you lay it out, you see that it's sort of what we call you know, point to point. It's, it's, it's a arbitrary configuration. Somebody builds a building, leases it over here. Somebody has a building over there. And we get a very inefficient mode. If you look at sort of the cluster configuration, which is on top, it creates a much more efficient. And I'll explain what that does. So if you take all the major anchors in the LA basin, in the Southern California basin, and these are the, the big color dots, and you look at all the suppliers, this big mesh, right? Very inefficient. If you, if you take like the World Logistics Center and you start congregating the big suppliers and the others, and in the World Logistics Center we take the big companies, right? The, 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 let's say the Amazons, and can you imagine that right next to them all the suppliers are right there, right? You have a thousand moves. They could be $500,000 a day if you have a thousand moves, right? That's $15 million a month. Right? That's over $150 million a year. You can give the building away. Right. It's even more expensive. So collapsing it has become important. So we're going from that to a hub configuration. You can see from a hub to a cluster configuration. And this is, if you look at the mathematics of it, if you have so many points you have to connect, right? and you want to do it in the most efficient way, you have the cluster effect. So if you see number of nodes and movements, right? How many movements does it take to get to, to the same spots? And you can see that if you have random configuration, it takes a lot of movements to get to the same number of nodes. In a cluster, it's a lot less, and that's the cluster advantage. So I, I might have just learned something. Man, I'm a little slow, apparently. So going back to, I don't know how easily you can go back and reanimate that slide you had previously. So, so part of your vision. This one? Yeah, that one. Yeah. But no, but put, the, put all the little dots and the red dots together. So part of the, there you go. So part of the vision of this logistics center is not only to have the, the, the main um, end product, so to speak, there, but to have all the suppliers, the guy who's, who's making the, the, the chip and the guy who's making the glass screen. Let's just use the uh, iPhone. Not that iPhones will ever be made here, but let's suppose Apple said, hey, guess what? We're going we're gonna to do this here. So the concept would be is to bring in as many of those 700 different suppliers of the parts and get as, as many of those as close as possible together as you can so they're not driving them and shipping them from all over the place. It's now they literally send a guy across the street and say, hey, here's the microchips you're looking for. Right. So that efficiency, again, does several things because we have sort of criteria where we target. So it so happens, again, that the most efficient business approach, right, saving you money, less movements, you know, in fact, in our software uh, infrastructure, you go in the cluster, and most of truck movements are less than full load, right? You know, you think something is leaving a facility, it's fully, let's say going to Chicago, it's full. Sometimes it's just a half, they have a half uh, a truck going out. Right. And you're across the street, you have no idea, you know, you don't talk to the guy across the street, and he has a half a truck going to Chicago. Now we have two trucks coming to the facility, they're each taking half a truck load to Chicago. Right. If you come on our platform, you say, let's say I'm Samsung, just to make an example, I have a half truck load going to Chicago next Tuesday, Way over there, somebody like uh, Panasonic says, I have a half truck load going to Chicago. I can have it there between Tuesday and Thursday. The, right? The computer, the platform puts it together. And now there's one truck going to Chicago. It's going to pick up something from Panasonic, half a truck. It's going to stop by in the same cluster. Right? right. At Samsung pick up half a truck, and I have one truck going to Chicago. Now, what happened here? Uh, it's good for the right, environment. You have one less truck going on there to Chicago, less traffic, less pollution, less everything else, and it cuts your cost by half, right? And yep. transportation is the biggest part of logistics. So part of what happens is, is this, and it makes sense. That's why clustering has always been efficient. You know, if you go, another example, we like downtown, why are all the lawyers and the banks and the courts are all downtown? Because if you're a lawyer, you don't want to go, every time you have to make an appearance, go across town, right? And right. then go across town to another bank, right? Today with the internet and everything else, we send documents and we get things done on the internet. But imagine a few years back, all of you are way too young for it, but you had to wait for a letter, you had to go get it you know, over to a bank, stand in line to do something. You know, it was, right. right? 
So all this efficiency uh, makes a big difference. So there's a huge benefit in this cluster. So we're not building just a one-off industrial building or logistic facility like most people see around here. It's a logistics cluster which is very different than what you typically see where you see one-off buildings uh, going around. And the biggest issue we have is we have this tremendous growth, right? 42 million TUs are expected to come. But this is the LA Basin. It's literally built out, right? So we, right now we have about 1.8 billion square feet of industrial space fully occupied in the LA Basin. About a billion of it is logistics related and nowhere to go, right? Out here in Ontario, there's literally no more land left right. to build it. So the most underestimated business trick for our region, a couple of them going, is the lack of land to support off-port logistics operation. You can get it in the port, but where do you take it? Where are you going to put it? Where yep. are you going to put it? So uh, we need to get more efficient. And this is something that will start happening in the market. It's already starting to move. And that is that the way the value of these buildings is viewed is entirely different. So this is an example of what we did with the building that Sketcher is in. So we have a 1.8 million square foot building, but the typical industrial building was 26, 32 foot clear. In other words, the clear height under beam, the utilized space you can actually use in the facility. And we, we built it to 45 foot clear. So we see people said that's a big building, it's a tall building, but what does that really mean? So if you take the, 30, the 32 to the 45, that's 13 feet higher. So what does 13 feet higher mean? It means that if you stacked it on top and put it on the side, it will be like building another 731,000 square foot building. That's the additional capacity in the building, right? In the same building, you have the capacity. Conventional building, like you see in Ontario, you would have to have built a 1.8 plus another 731,000, right? So what that means, one sketch of building at 45 foot clear is equivalent right, to 1.8 for 731,000 square feet, or to 1.25, right, 1 million and a quarter, two 1.2 million square foot buildings, or three 831,000 square foot buildings, or four 632 figures. So one building, right, the way it's designed, the first one of its kind that we did, the sketch of building, create this kind of efficiency. So one building, basically has the same capacity as all this. So, you, so you're not pricing these on a square footage basis anymore. Right. You price them on a cubic foot. Right. So now you're dealing with capacity, not with square footage. Imagine office buildings and you charge rent, not on usable space every floor, but just on the ground floor. Right. So you got a 10,000 foot footprint and you got a 10 story building and the rent will be just for the ground floor. Your rents are turning into cubic feet rent. Everybody understand what cubic feet rent is? You take the cubic feet capacity of the building, how much you can store in or utilize, and that's the rent. So our next leases are going to be cubic feet leases, not so much square foot leases, although it could be translated back to a square foot price. And you could see from uh, the previous slide, there's a little map. So if you have a 45 square foot, I mean a, a 45 clear height building, you can have the rent equivalent so if at that time, this was a slide from a few years ago, uh, you can rent space out here for a 32 foot clear at 37 cents. That price now is closer to 55 cents, but at 37, but you had to, uh, to get the same capacity to at least 2.5 million square feet. So if you can get the same capacity and 1.8 million square feet, the equivalent rent would have been 51 cents back then. Now it's 75 cents to 50 cents, right? But you can see what happens. The square foot, per square foot value of the buildings is going up because of uh, what they're doing. So another big driver that is happening is e-commerce. Everybody knows that. Everybody buys stuff on the internet. But people don't realize what it actually means to our economy. There's several things happening. So we used to have the infrastructure for retail the way we shop now in transition. This is how we went shopping. Now we go out to the store. And the infrastructure to support that kind of shopping looked like this, right? That's what shopping centers look like. Who still goes to the grocery store to buy their food? Who, let, me, let me do it the other way. Who's not going to the grocery store anymore to buy their food? They're using, okay, so two of you. Be interesting it, to ask that question um, a year from now. 
And I'll show you what's happening so you, you, you start to realize what's coming. So, so this, is, uh, this is how we go shopping and the infrastructure to support it looks like this. Our shopping centers, our, our uh, supermarket. Now we shop like this. And the infrastructure to support this kind of shopping looks like this. Right? It's a whole different mechanism in place. And it's growing in a phenomenal rate. Right now, uh, you know, e-commerce is about $2.3 trillion globally and moving to about $3 trillion. If you can imagine what that is, it's like building a third of the U.S. economy in a few years. And it will surpass it. So it's like building the entire United States economy in a few years. It's almost unimaginable when you, if we look at the rapid pace. But what does it mean to America? What does it mean to us here? So we're a consumer society, right? We're a consumer economy. And we buy about $4 trillion worth of goods every year, right? In all the shopping centers in America. We buy about $4 trillion to all the brick and mortar, all the shopping centers, malls in America. And we buy those through 12 billion square feet of brick and mortar shopping centers throughout America, right? So we buy $4 trillion a year, and we buy through traditionally, right, 12 billion square feet, all the shopping centers in America. Well, this year, we had about $400 billion right, go through e-commerce, right? Amazon and companies like that, products we bought. Well, what does that mean? If we would have had to sell, or rather buy, $400 billion worth of goods through the traditional model of brick and mortar retail stores, we would have to have built 1.2 billion square feet all over America of new shopping centers that never got built because it was sold through e-commerce. Right. Right? And what that's done, it really collapsed the old model of retail. And you can see that in the malls, like the big anchors, the model in America for shopping center was the big anchors and everybody in between. So the big anchor peaked sort of 18 years ago. And by 2015, the sales per square foot was equivalent to what it was 25 years earlier, 1990. Wow. So what so, is that? So the mall's dead. The mall is dead. And what's really happening is if you look at 2,000 feet, the average sales per square foot was $165 for those big anchors. And that's 24 less than it was 10 years ago. And that was instead of moving forward, it's going backwards. And in fact, these are the two, you know, JC Penney's here, not to pick on them, but just a good example. So for JC Penney to go back to 2006 sales level, they will have to close about 30%, a third of all the stores. Sears will have to close about 43% of all the stores. And if you read the news lately, now I did this about a year ago, a year right. and a half ago. Right. And if you read the news now, Sears is sort of my right, big yeah. challenge. Uh, can you hold the questions? We'll, we'll get to those. And this is why some of the malls look like this. In America now, 270 malls close. Right. Not so much in California yet, but throughout the United States, Regional malls have been closing, right? So, and you can see these are different retailers. Each one of them closed about 200 stores in the last couple of years. Right. Instead of expanding and opening new stores, they're actually closing stores. Well, the irony of it, we talked a lot about Marino Valley, and you guys know I have an office in Marino Valley, and many of you are from Marino Valley. And, and I don't mean to sound this as a, as a knock on the Marino Valley Mall, but there could be an argument made that the Marino Valley Mall never really opened, right? I mean, it's been there now for, what, I don't know, 20 years, and it's never really quite gotten off the ground, and, um, and, and, and gosh darn, the, the future of that mall and pretty much every other mall in the country is right. looking pretty, um, pretty scary. Right, so there'll be changes. You can see here, all the traditional big retailers from Sears to Walmart to Target, their stock price have been going down substantially, and what does that mean? So Wall Street evaluate the value of a company best, based on what they project their earning will be. Are they going to make more and more money over the years on less and less money? And Wall Street, basically in the aggregate, all the investors, all of us in the country feeling like those guys are not going to do better and better and better. They're going to do worse and worse and worse. But look what they think about people are in commerce like Amazon. Yep. Their stock is up for the roof. People think people are going to buy more and more on the internet than through brick and mortar stores. Bill Gates, not Bill Gates. Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs from Apple understood that early on. And Apple sale, about 80% of the sales is on e-commerce. They have stores, it's almost like showrooms. You can take a look at the product, play with it, ask questions. 
And then 80% of the sales actually go for the web. Who's been to an Apple store lately? Every time I go to an Apple store, I'm like, how come they don't have an Apple store on every corner? Right? Because they need an Apple store on every corner. Well, this is why they don't have an Apple store in every corner, because you know, pretty soon, they, who knows, they might have less Apple stores. Well, they saw that, obviously, being in technology way ahead. And you know, he understood logistics is the forefront of retail. And the distinction between retail and distribution of warehouses is sort of collapsing. You know, when you buy stuff from Amazon, it's going through a logistics center, not through a retail store. Right. And so, you know, logistics is the new retail as well. This is happened to be the schedule building, but it, it's basically where it, it's going through. And the big difference is, right, we used to go to retail, right? We go to the store, we pick our stuff, we put it in a bag, and we take it home, right? We used to go to retail. The difference is, is retail is coming to us. We order it, and the store is literally coming to us. They're delivering out you know, the, the, the goods to us. So instead of going to a store, the store is coming to us, right? With delivery, uh, right, overnight. Sometimes it's within the same day. Everybody's competing. Now, one other thing that's going to make a huge difference coming in, a big trend. I don't know if you can see this. Yep, I got it. Uh, Lance, but the cost of technology, right? We talk about smart devices, but what does that really mean? So who can tell me what was the cost of one gigabyte in 1980? I don't know. I was paying I was paying three thousand dollars for a laptop that had like one mega RAM, <laughs> right? I remember upgrading a computer. I think it was in 1985. I went from one mega RAM, one megabyte. My brother came over and cracked open the computer. He put in a chip, and we went to two megabytes of RAM. And I thought I had just seen magic. Um, and those machines, I mean, I'm buying laptops today for cheaper than what we were buying laptops. I don't know about the memory, but the entire machine was twice as much. Right. You know, Just one years gigabyte. Ago. So who, take a guess. Who wants to take a guess? 500 bucks. I would have bought many of those for 500 bucks. It was a million dollars. Wow. Okay. So now, what's the cost of one gigabyte today? 10 bucks. Less, what, two dollars? Okay. Penny. Oh. Okay. So what, what you see is that little chip now has over a million transistors. It's literally printed. It's like printing paper, more sophisticated, obviously. But the cost of it is literally collapsed. And so what happens is you start to see the proliferation of what you call smart devices. How many people go to the phone and they can turn on the car, or they can turn on the alarm, or they can turn on the lights? or they can turn off the lights, or do all bunch, you know, all bunch of functions. Each one of these devices is a smart device, has a little computer in it, and it's talking to everything else, Wi-Fi and everything else. Now, the chip is so inexpensive, the hardware, rather, is so inexpensive, the differentiating factor is the software that operates. So the hardware become not, used to be the hardware was expensive, now the hardware you can put anywhere, it's just what you want it to do, right? So what does that all mean? We'll have, by 2020, 4 billion connected people. You know, we all have iPhones and cell phones and smartphones. And we'll have 25 billion connected devices, right? You can talk to your car, turn on the car, turn on the air conditioning, turn on the lights, on and off, the alarms. Everything is talking to each other. And Samsung had <laughs> a new refrigerator, which I see where it's taking inventory. Mm -hmm. Right, so you could see inside the refrigerator, and you could see what when you, when you you populate your, you know, it's going to come to the point where it's going to tell you, you're going to put in and say, okay, when my milk is done to a quart, populate the shopping list. Yep. When I'm done to half a dozen eggs, populate my shopping list. Eventually, you get it, and you say order, right, and it'll get delivered to you like an Uber, right? It's already prepaid, and you just order your grocery, and you tell it what time you want it delivered, and it'll come to you. It's already starting. You see, Amazon bought. Whole yeah. Foods. Yeah. So that whole trend is kind of, in fact, you know, grocery is, is the most, almost it's a primitive form of logistics. So what do you do? You put the warehouse in the neighborhood closer to your customer, yeah. right? You stock it with diapers and ketchup and everything else. You make the customer come to the store, do the picking, right. put it on the cart, process the, the, the billing, right? Then become his well, own delivery, 
guy, right, right. or girl, put it in your car and deliver it to the customer. Okay, I'm going to ask the question again. Uh, so who's, who is not going to the grocery store to buy their groceries? Okay, two of you. Three, okay. I discovered Amazon Fresh a year or so ago, which was kind of cool. You go on Amazon, you give me a gallon of milk, whatever it happens. You can buy pretty much anything except alcohol. And sometimes the same day, the next day it comes, okay? Um, now, what's the one you're using, Drew? Instacart. Instacart. No, who's, who's, who, you have, who has not heard of Instacart? Should be everybody that didn't. But you can be, my wife and I were laying in bed three weeks ago or a month ago, whatever it happens to be, and it's, it's 8 o'clock at night, and we want some ice cream. And I'm saying, oh, honey, go, go get some ice cream. I'm like, I'm in my pajamas. I'm relaxing. I have no desire to go to Ralph's and get ice cream, 8 o'clock at night. So she had been talking to Drew, and said, let's check out this Instacart thing. No joke. 45 minutes later, there is somebody standing at my door, went to my Ralph supermarket, my Ralph supermarket in Canyon Crest, they bought that and some pretzels and some other things and showed up on my door 45 minutes later at 8.45, 9 o'clock at night with a half a gallon of Rocky Road. Yeah. I'm never going to the store again. So, you know, a bus, you know, the logistics infrastructure. So I, I had this experience in Los Angeles. We called some restaurant to deliver food. They said, take an hour. We called Uber Eats, right? Half an hour. So you can look at even nationally. We're kind of in a, in a country now where it takes the police longer to come to you than a pizza delivery. Yeah? The pizza will get, if you're ever in trouble, call a pizza. The guy will be at your door <laughs> helping you out. Call the police, they'll be there 45 minutes later. So call pizza, they'll be there before the police would. So we got to fix that. But again, it's, it's because, you know, in other countries, they're even more. Nice. This is Korea. You're anywhere in the supermarket. These are computer screens. You just go in and you pick, your, you pick the products you want, you order it, and it gets to where you are. So uh, what's the next step? I was in Israel, and I, I saw that. So you now have a virtual supermarket. You don't have to go and, and look at a list of products. You're coming in the supermarket. And because it's virtual, they can make it the fanciest, nicest, most beautiful supermarket in the world. And here's the interesting part. You put in your criteria. Let's say you say, I don't want enough. I don't want fat, and I want a little sugar, and I, I'm concerned about cholesterol, and I don't want fats. You put your criteria, and the only thing that populates the shelves is food that meet that criteria, hmm. products that meet that criteria, which means you can't buy bad food. You're now going shopping, and whatever you're picking is already pre-sorted to give you any choice you want is going to fit that criteria. So that's coming. You don't even have to go to a supermarket. You can have the same experience. You just do it virtually. But people said, well, you know, I, clothes, for example, I want, to, you know, I want to test them. I want to see what, how it fits me. Well, I saw that. Then I have scanners. And it creates a virtual mannequin of you, very accurate. And now you can actually put on a dress, and it'll show you exactly how it will fit you, right? And Toshiba is already starting with delivering products where you're going to stores and, and you could see how any garment will look on you without actually test, you know, putting it on. So now you could be at home, look at the internet, look at clothes, have your virtual mannequin stored, right? Try anything on, see how you look, how yep. you feel in it, and without having to return, because returns are a big deal, right? Return, you know, reverse logistics is a big issue. You get something, you want to return it, this will soon, and food too. You know, we used to have ag, right? We have thousands of acres and we run tractors and we, and if you have ag that's in buildings closer to population, fresher food, everybody wants fresh food. We don't want somebody, some food that's picked seven weeks ago or was stored in a warehouse like oranges and other things and finally it gets to you. It's no longer what we call fresh food. The food industry has got very good at making it look pretty, right? But how many people taste food now? Grapes don't taste like grapes. Tomatoes don't taste like tomatoes. Cucumber, they all sort of lost the taste. That's because we, we got, we're picking them way before they're ripe because we got to do all this delivery cycle. So we're going to see agriculture come closer. Hmm. Now, why am I showing all of this? E-commerce is driving things, clothes, anything you buy, groceries, agriculture, they all need to be housed. 
in these facilities and then deliver to a customer someplace. Hmm. So there, there's a tremendous push, and you see this going and going, the demand for these big logistics facilities are almost in, in every industry. So I don't know if you want to stop for questions, but I can go through the rest very yeah, quickly. Let, let's let's do this because, and this is one of the benefits of, of only having Edo on the agenda, and, and not, not that you guys are going to be here until 3 o'clock, but I have this room till 3 o'clock, and we may, who's sticking around for our training, by the way? Okay, so we may not start at 9, 10.45, or we might start a half hour later. And, and Ido hasn't told me he's got a plane to catch in 10 minutes. So, so let's just, there's a couple of things I want to talk about, and then we'll take some questions. I know there was a couple of people that we had some hands up. Okay, um, this is fascinating to me. I mean, I don't know what you guys are thinking. Most of us are in the residential world, but to think that what Ido's talking about doesn't impact our residential housing world and how it impacts our business. Honestly, as he's going through and, and showing those slides, and we're talking about groceries, and we're talking about now we buy our clothes, we stand in front of a fake mirror and put some on it. I got to tell you, I just think about how that's going to impact me as a broker owner of a real estate company with brick and mortar in four locations with thousands of square feet that I can walk through at any given time. You know, the old joke in the real estate business and, and, and certainly our, our title and mortgage and affiliated folks can know this is true. You can walk through almost any real estate office on the planet successful on any given point in the day, and you could shoot a gun in any direction, not anybody, right? They're empty. Now, we might think, well, why, where are they? Are these agents not productive? Are they not doing anything? Well, the reality is if they are productive and they are doing something, they ain't doing it there in the office because that's not where business gets done, okay? Same thing with the consumers. You know, it used to be a big deal to have floor time um, who's been in this business for more than 10, 15 years? Real estate side. Okay, so then you understand floor time. Most offices don't have floor time anymore. The location of a real estate office used to be important because, hey, we might have some walk-ins, okay? I have four real estate offices. The only office we have walk-ins in occasionally is Claremont because Claremont's in one of those locations. But, but those people aren't walking in because they necessarily want to buy a house. They're parked in the parking lot on the way to the, the hair salon, and because that's how the Claremont Village is, I'm like, oh, well, I don't see a real estate office. Let's go in and talk to an agent. So I got to tell you, I worry about the future of our business as it relates to logistics. And I don't know that, that logistics necessarily apply to a real estate operation, but there's a lot of things that are similar. As, and we could talk about Zillow and Realtor.com and, and, and iBuyers and, and, and you know, consumers, not consumers, companies like Zillow connecting consumers directly and cutting us out of the picture. Now you've got buyers and sellers going together. So this stuff kind of scares the shit out of me. We can edit that part out, Mike. Um, it scares me, but at the same time, there's also opportunity. Somebody, is, somebody out there is going to adjust the business model to take advantage of this in the same way that um, a company like Amazon um, who wasn't that long ago that Amazon sold books, right? You know, geez, you know, well, they're doing a little bit more than buying, selling books today. So let's do this. Um, I just want to talk a little bit residential, and then we'll open it up to some questions. And um, I think unless Cito's has to be somewhere, we can, we can go for another 10 or 15 minutes if need be with some questions, even though we're technically out of time. Okay, um, your company and yourself, you are, even though we haven't touched on it, you own residential buildable lots. And I, I, we talked about this earlier, so I kind of know the answer. So why are you not building houses in the Inland Empire right now? What, what, what has to happen for you to build houses? So we're a little bit different because, you know, we operate on a larger scale, but we're not public. So we take decisions where it, it makes absolute sense on, on our model. So, we do own several thousand lots in the Inland Empire and master plan communities. Some of them are approved. But why we haven't built them yet is we're looking at the price points where new construction will start making a lot of sense. And it's getting there. It is getting there. We've seen that. You've all seen that with home prices. And when it gets to sort of a, a, a point where we think the returns justify the effort, uh, then we start building. And so what we have done, what I've done strategically, is get everything what I call ready to go. So we put all the backbone infrastructure, all the basic stuff we will need to get right into market. Because if you have, let's say, land, and you have to prepare it to go to market, in California, we talked about CEQA, could yep. take you several years. Yep. 
just pulling building permits on infrastructure, putting a water line, a sewer line, dealing with Edison and power, could take years, two, three, four years. So the market shows up, and you say you're ready to go, and the first time you can move dirt will be three years from now. And, and in the and next conference, three years from now, you say, well, you know, interest rates are up, some other thing happened. So it creates an unusual situation in California, particularly, where there is a huge amount of risk and unpredictability in terms of uh, the process. And by the way, leading to our economy, what happens, people complain. You, know, you, you hear about all these Wall Street movement and the top and all the 25% of all corporate pro profits in America you know, comes from investment banks. So what happens? The risk at a business level is so high that, you know, think about it in the old days. You know, you can own a shovel, we have a truck, we're good hardworking guys, we, we, we raise some money, we borrow some money, and we go buy a couple of lots, and we know how to build, so we build a couple of homes, and we did that successfully, and we go buy another five acre little parcel, we subdivide that, we're a local engineer, we go buy, build five, ten houses, we do well. You know, banks want to talk to us now. We go to the SNL or the bank, and we borrow more money. We can buy 10 acres. We're going to build a 50, 60 unit track, and we grew. Because you had a lot of local builders, right? You had a lot of that going on. Well, because of all the regulatory environments and other things that happen, the risk is enormous. Right now, if you want right. to do that, you have to go through CEQA. Right. And EIR can cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. And after you finish that, there's no telling if you get approved, as they say. Depending who will scream loudest in front of a particular city council in a given day, you may get approved or unapproved. So now you got the money, you borrow the money, or you raise the money, or you spend your own money, and you bought the little plot, and now you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on plan and EIRs, and then you get in front of a council, and somebody across the street doesn't like it, they scream loud enough, they turn it down. All that investment, high risk. But maybe you did get the permit. You got approved. Well, now under CEQA, anybody can see you in the state of California. You can be living in Arizona or Alaska and sue you on a project in California. So now you spend several more years, right? And the average could take you anywhere from five to 10 years. Large projects, about 10 years. So big companies can afford that kind of risk. So what happens to Wall Street? They aggregate a bunch of projects, they put them all together, spread the risk, and they take a cut of it. So what happens, everybody sort of became institutional. You've been in the business long enough to know. You go back a few years back, you got lots of local builders. Oh, yeah. All kinds of local builders. Small builders, medium-sized building, regional builders, national builders, all active. You can probably count active home builders on one hand. Yeah. Right? Huge consolidation, and all of them, by and large, are institutional. Right. All right? the big ones. We, we did it, and we didn't do it super scientific, but when Drake was helping us with the market forecast and... You, know, you had the big ones. You had Lewis, and you had you know D.R. Horton, and you had a few others, but we didn't see a whole lot of you know John Jones, you know home building stuff going on out there. Um, it was all the big guys that were that were players right now. Right, and so what happens is the risk factor and the amount of years it takes, which is sort of counterintuitive for what America is. Right, America was built on entrepreneurs, the small guy that can raise a little money. Hardworking guy, can buy a small plot, subdivide it, build a few homes, go to be a, a local builder, and a regional builder, and so forth. Uh, the risk and the cost to even do a small project is so enormous that the small guy is not on that path anymore. Right. can't get there, right? So uh, there'll be other things. Look, I, I don't want it, everybody to be discouraged, but like you said, it takes a new mind, you know, mindset. Most people are still thinking about remodeling video stores when the world has gone to Netflix. Yep. So you can think about making the most beautiful video store, and it doesn't matter how nice you make the video stores, the world has gone to Netflix. Yep. So same thing with records. You know, how many people remember Tower Records? Yep. Everybody remembers Tower Blockbuster Records. Blockbuster video. Yeah. Tower Records, right? The internet and the technology was coming in. And they said, nobody's going to buy music on the web. Right. They Let's open more make, stores. Do they even make CDs anymore? <laughs> I <laughs> thought I just heard that yeah. CDs were Let's gone. make more uh, Let's put more stores. And you know what? Right. Let's remodel them. We'll be even nicer, make a nicer experience for the consumer. Well, how many people have seen Tower Records lately? Right. Right. OK. So what has happened? Doesn't matter how long you've been in the business. It doesn't matter how nice you want to make the old model work. The world has moved on. 
So you got to think about what's coming. And it's moving pretty it. damn fast. Right. This is the, the music analogy that you're just using. I, um, when, when Apple, you know, prior or after Napster, everyone was stealing music and all the rest. I'm like, well, I'm not going to steal music. That's stealing. That's not, I would, who's going to do that? So I would buy my music. I'd go on Apple iTunes or whatever, and I'd pay buck fifty, two dollars a dollar for a song, and the kids would look at me like I'm nuts. I own tens of, I have paid for tens of thousands of dollars of music that I own. And yeah, you're shaking your head. So, I, and I don't even know how this happens. So then I, I, I realized, I think about a, like six months ago or a year ago, some, Apple sent me this thing and said, hey, we got this Apple Music thing and you give us $10 a month. So for some, I must have signed up and gave him my credit card and didn't know what I was doing. And then all of a sudden, I think six months later, I realized that when I'm on my phone and I'm playing music, that I'm, I'm hearing music that I didn't buy. And I'm like, wait a minute, I don't own that song. I didn't pay $1.20 for, for that particular song. Uh, and then Drake or Drew's like, hey, you idiot. You know, you don't, nobody owns music anymore. You know, you subscribe to the service and you listen to whatever the hell you want, whatever, as long as, of course, you, uh, it's, it's a whole other model, um, which makes me a little concerned about the real estate model. So but at any rate, the reason I'm showing going. you that is that you convert concern to awareness, and then when the awareness comes, you're gonna start thinking of ideas or things you're not even thinking now right. because you're seeing a video store or record stores and you're not thinking about anything else. So the idea is you know, to open the awareness to what's going on and then you can start, you know, look, it's not new. People think, oh, technology and automation, robotics is new and look what's happening to the job place. A hundred years ago, before the tractor, before electricity, if you were a farmer, you had a hundred acres, you need 30 people spend a week behind horse and plow to plow 100 acres. Now one guy on a tractor does it in a day, yep. right? So what happened in America? We lost 25 million jobs on the farm, but we created 120 million jobs. How do we do that? So if all you knew how to do is put a hay bale in front of a horse, it was challenging to get a job because nobody needs you to do that because there's a tractor now. But if you were a welder, a mechanic, right? If you went to work, General Motors were hiring, General Electric were Caterpillar, John Deere were hiring, combines, tractors, then you need dealerships, then you need gas stations, then you need spare parts, then you need mechanics in every gas. We created 125 million jobs while we lost 25 million jobs, farming jobs. Everybody used to live on a farm. So those transitions happen every time we gain productivity. What I mean by gain productivity? Tools of productivity is like a tractor. It makes the most productive. So the first instinct is to say, well, gee, well, now nobody have a job. Look, we used to all be you know, on the farm you know, walking behind a horse, plowing the farm, the field, nobody needs this now. A tractor does the whole job, right? But a tractor is a tool of productivity. And what happens when you release people, right, for menial jobs, you unleash huge amount of creativity and productivity. And that's what happens, right? So if you go to the supermarket back in those days, you'd go to the country store and you'd have 12 different kinds of canned foods and four different pairs of shoes to choose from and, you know, four different, you know, Eyeglass frames to choose from, limited. Right. You go to the mall now, the supermarket now, there's 100,000 products on the, on the shelf, right? Because we're more productive. 100,000, each one of those items has to be conceived, designed, manufactured, distributed, marketed, <laughs> advertised, accounted for, banked, financed, huge amount of more jobs. So the fact that we're getting to this new phase of technology, automation, the internet, all of those things are producing, look, there's 600,000 people today, I think, in the uh, supporting Apple. Apple literally doesn't make a single product. Right. Right? Design. Design the product. Now, who, who ever had a job 10 years ago being an app developer? Didn't exist. Right? Who was writing apps and having a business developing apps? Right. And getting paid to do apps? Nobody. So all these jobs showed up as a result of these new tools, this new technology. But it does require us to think ahead, and that's why I wanted to show you some of this, because you start seeing, for example, if you see logistics coming into town, you say, wait a minute, I know what's all behind it. And one more thing that's happening, and I, I want to talk about that, because I think it might be helpful for everybody to understand what's coming, right? Like grocery, like we talked about grocery, right? Grocery lends itself perfect to logistics. You know why? Because you might say expensive items, or I, I want to go see it, right? Before I want to buy this apple, I want to go to the store and I want to touch and feel it. 
But groceries, you're buying the same ketchup over and over again, the same diapers over and over again. How many, right. how many times do you buy the same brand? You got to catch up. I don't know if you like Heinz, you buy the same Heinz ketchup over and over again. Yep. You don't need to go to a store to see. Right. Because you're already familiar with the product. All you need is get it delivered to you. Right. How many times do you have to see the diaper over and over again? You know, I've seen it once. You know, we're ordering it now on the web. Right. So grocery is going to transform. You got to be careful with that, though. Who, who's on a subscription at Amazon for stuff? Okay, well, I subscribe to the Tide Pods for the laundry, and then I subscribe to dog food, and then I subscribe to water, because we get those things all the time. But I didn't quite have the timing exactly. My logistics was a little screwed up. Do you know how many? I have enough Tide Pods to do laundry for like the next 10 years. I'm like, oh, damn, I got to cancel that, and then I forget. Right. And I have enough dog food to feed the entire neighborhood. So I finally had to go into Apple and say, okay, so, okay I got to slow this down. Instead of, you know, every two weeks, I got to go every six weeks and stuff like that. But I'm figuring that out, and I don't ever want to go to the store so, again. So what, what I'm really saying is every time there's an issue or a problem or a challenge, somebody's already figuring out the solution. So what you said about is why those chips are going to be in every product. Right. And when you get your tight box, it's going to know. It's going to say when it comes down to half, or when it comes down to whatever level, populate and order the next one. Don't just order it automatically because right. I've been on vacation for two months, right. haven't done laundry. Now I got. It's going to know that I don't need the Tide Pods. Detergent. Yeah. It's going to only do it when you need it. It's amazing. Right? So all of these things, right, we're in the transition that, you know, we talk about AI and artificial intelligence. Uh, we used to have smart people and dumb phones. <laughs> Right now we have right, smartphones. Right. Uh, hopefully the people are getting smarter as well. Right. <laughs> but. Not happening. Right. The, the, the people. The, the education. <laughs> education. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So you know you gotta. You used to be able to make a good living moving your hands. Now you're gonna move your head. Yep. Right. Think about what you're doing. But right. let, let, let's do this because um, although nobody's left, so I think you guys are liking this, right? All right, so let, let's take a few questions. Um, let's, let's start with William and Rose and then Gil. And, and, and we don't have mics out there, so stand up. And, oh, well, stand up and speak There's loudly. A mic over there. And Ingrid's bringing a mic, but you can project, William. What do you got? I have a two-part question. Um, when you built Skechers, how long did it take for Skechers to say, we want to go there? Or, or I mean, it could have been some other business name. Did you build that for Skechers? Were no, they, we, we, well, we built it. But Skechers were already signed up as we will be. We, we de designed the product, as they say, this, okay. this iPhone. That's Build the that suit. Technology. And Skechers came in into the building. It wasn't built to meet Skechers specifications. In other words, it wasn't a build to Skechers. It was basically a building that's, ve from the early inception of the building, Skechers was already interested in a location and what the building had to offer, what we had to offer. So it came all together. So as soon as we build it, sketches moved They in. were there. Yeah. But you, would you have built it if they, if they weren't there? Would you have built that on spec? Probably not. We're not speculating in that sense. Right. But the market demand is so huge. So every year, as you know, out here, we've probably been building about 20 million square feet and absorbing 20 million square feet a year. So some people say, well, the World Logistics Center is large, 41 million square feet. But that's essentially two-year supply. Yeah. So, and we're running out of product. You can't build anymore in Ontario hardly. You know, most markets are already built out. So it could happen very fast, hmm. right? So I hope that answers the question. Well, yeah. So in theory, um, they saw the value in the Leeds building. So if you take the Skechers model, if you build it, they will come kind of thing. It, to some extent, when you have a market right, that has a lot of demand, and the demand is real, you're seeing it every year, uh, it's not, you don't need to, to uh, be a huge, you know, sale or, or predictor, right? Uh, E-commerce, nobody has to say, gee, it's gonna grow, right? We, we all right. know we're adapting to it, we're all buying stuff on the internet. And when you look at that and you say, okay, so e-commerce is gonna go at 10, 15% a year compounded, and if you look at what that means, 40, 50, 60 billion dollars a year of extra sales on the web, you can see the equation says, right, some less retail is going to be built. Right? So if you're building shopping centers, you really understand what you do, you know, where you're going. Right. But at the same time, moving an extra 40, 50, 60 billion dollars a year of product through the web requires more logistics facilities. So you could see why those things parallel. And so in reality, we're not really today anyway. When I started out in 2004, it was a little bit you know, looking at the future. 
right? It wasn't a self-apparent that this is what's happening in the world. Right. Nobody really understood that when you crack open your laptop, there's that much going on. People thought, well, it's made in China. But if you were aware of it back then, just like you're maybe aware of new things today, you start thinking differently and understanding right. where you fit in the world and what you can do to improve things. Yeah, and, and who's, who's truly 100% devoted to the commercial real estate world in here? That's what I figured. Okay, oh, well, we got one of you, okay. Um, so I'll show my ignorance a little bit. Nito, of course, will correct me. But you talk about building on spec. Yeah, I got you, Rose. Um, but just, just driving through the Moreno Valley and the 215 corridor in Riverside over the last several years, there was a lot of, of tilt-up type construction. And I would be amazed at what I would see that was being built, and then it would, it would be completed. And then I would drive by it six months later, and parking lot's empty, there's nobody there. And I'd drive by a year later, and I'd think, wow, these, these folks are, were building these, and they did not have a sketchers ready to move in. Well, there did seem to be a little bit of a, of a lag time of, of vacancies on those buildings, but now if you drive by those same buildings today, the majority of them, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, it appears as though every single one of those buildings that I looked at three years ago, four years ago, and I thought, wow, these guys really screwed up. You know, they built these buildings and nobody came. Well, they did come. Um, they might not have come six months after the building was finished, but a lot of those projects appear to be Full. Yeah, and the, the reason they build SPAC, and why it takes you know, sometimes to lease up, because they're building ahead of the market, right? They're waiting for the market, but it's not such a complicated equation. It, you know, either the commercial brokerage community or because you have market data, it tells you the market will demand 20 million square foot right. a year. And so you're a builder, you say, look, I'm gonna build a building, yep. because as long as they haven't built 80 million square foot in the market, yep. I'm, I'm gonna lease mine, right? Imagine it, it's like if you're in the residential market, somebody comes to your office and they're putting deposits and you have 100 people deposit, we want homes, we can't buy any, and you're a home builder. He says, yeah, I'm gonna start building homes because you know, every broker I talk to has got a list of 50 people waiting in line, they can bring and buy the homes. So because there's a restricted market, meaning that there's limited supply, and so people are more apt to, to build spec because they say, I can build it, the demand is about 20 million square feet, and really because of the dynamics of the market, it, I, I won't be in a situation where all of a sudden there's 40 million square feet in the market, right. or 80 million square feet spec. So they realize that the demand to the amount of spec is aligned, and they figure that I'll take a year, 12 months of lease up, so you know, they open the building, some building gets leased right away, some build six months later. But within a year, most of them get You know, a parallel I think that, that most of us in this room might be able to relate to that aren't necessarily focused on the commercial side is I can remember 15 years ago, um, the, I'm looking across the street in my office and they're building a 300 unit apartment building. And we do property management. I'm like, well, what are they doing? I got vacant units and vacancies. And then they're, then they're building a 400 unit apartment building. And then they're building a 800 unit apartment building. And I'm like, where in, who, who these guys are idiots. Why are they building all? Well, you know what? I'm the idiot. Because not only did they fill those up, they've been building them and building them and building them. Um, and whatever data, those, those very smart people somewhere sat back and said, boy, the demand for rental units. And by the way, they tried to rent an apartment in Riverside area. I mean, my God, I mean, for a two bedroom, Nothing. It's you know seventeen. We're 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 starting to get seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars. They're starting to approach those prices. Um, I mean, we're still at Orange County, where you're spending you know three thousand dollars a month for a Cracker Box. But um, anyway, I, I'm just amazed how I, I thought I was connected to the real estate market and the and the residential market and the apartment market, but I wasn't. Um, so at any rate, okay, Rose, you had a question. So I'm glad that you brought that as a point as to these investors coming in and building multi-units as opposed to residential yep. homes, which kind of killed the home ownership here in California. So you, you think that killed the home ownership? I, you know, there were no homes being built. So we're having all these developers building all these multi-unit apartment uh, apartments. So what does it do? Short of demand, raises the affordability of uh, home ownership way up there. So people are now renting. That's why rent percentages have gone up and rents are out of control, right? Well, my concern is the same kind of thing here with um, the logistics type of thing. 
I'm looking at the future. I'm not just looking at the immediate uh, convenience that we all take, consumers and going into online and getting the products. I'm looking more as to you build this logistics and the way I see it, like Amazon, they put out a lot of these other businesses out of business. Huh. Sears, you know, you name it. And so what does that do? I, that to me, the way I look at it is kind of like monopolizing and having a little bit of the control. So, so let, me, let me put it into question, or let me try to. So your concern, and I think we're all have, we, we all kind of understand the concern. If, if, if Amazon continues its trend, mm -hmm. what does that do to the hardware store? What does that do to the Macy's? Well, what and you know, the entrepreneurship to? is apparently they right. build up jobs. The way I look at it with the logistics and the technology is if we have it all in one place, how much you say that it'll bring jobs? Are they local jobs or are they you know, jobs from other countries? Are we building the products here locally where we can keep the products here? Um, so that's the vision that I have in the future. Where is this going to end up? How is it going to um, get rid of the uh, entrepreneur and also the um, blue color? What's the downside? And, and What's the blue downside color? to Zito? So, so there's, I understand the challenge. We see all this automation, all this advancement, right? You know, what's going to happen to jobs? What's going to happen to people? What's going to happen to the lock of store? So this is not a new phenomenon, right? It's like when you were on the farm and John Deere comes up with a tractor or a combine, we say, oh, it's going to ruin all the farmers, right? We're not going to have farm. And it's true. 97% of America 150 years ago were living on a farm. Nobody was in a factory. There was no General Motors. There was no Boeing. There was no McDonnell Douglas. There was no Whirlpool. There was no manufacturing, per se. Everybody lived on the farm. So what happened is there was a transition. Luckily, what we did in America then is we created a high school movement. You know how the high school movement came about? No. All these kids, right? People used to have big families. We needed 10 kids because we have a farm and, you know, everybody. Well, now we have all these kids and the tractor is here. We don't need 10 kids to, to, to go work the farm. So what are we going to do with all these youth? They created a high school movement. What was the unintended consequence of all these high school? People got educated. All of a sudden, they became engineers. They can make cars. They can invent airplanes. They can invent computers. And then we created more jobs and new industry, a different lifestyle than the lifestyle on the farm. Today, people forget, but our grandparents worked on the farm. You tell a kid today, well, go pick tomatoes, go do this. No, right? So life has changed. So what do we have to do? Education is important. A lifestyle will change. Look, uh, 100 years ago, before electricity, uh, be, taking care of a household was a full-time job, right? You need to cook for all the family. It took the whole day to make the fire and then to make the laundry and to do all of those things. It took a whole day. Then what happened? Automation. We have washing machine, dishwashers, vacuum cleaners, all these things. Now, instead of, let's say, typically the woman was taking care of the household in the old days, she spends the whole day. She has no time to do anything else. Cooking for everybody, washing for everybody. Now you throw the dishes, you throw the, the laundry in the machine, you go somewhere else. Now you can have jobs, you can sell real estate, you can do other things. It's still a challenge, it's double work, you still do houseworks, but a lot of things are easier. You can throw the right. machines in the washing machine, you don't have to ba you know, do everything. So lifestyle changes. In the transition, it's difficult because it dislocates skills. If all I know is to put a hay bill in front of a horse, I'm worried about a job. But if I'm a mechanic and I go to school and study, everybody wants to hire me. Right? If you're a computer programmer today, you go out of school, there's 20 employers wanting to take you. Right? So the point is that we have to understand what's changing. We have to understand what the jobs are. Right? That's why I say in America, everybody should study what they want. But nobody informing people what they should study. Look, if you want to study, let's say, I don't know what, I don't want to make fun of any profession, but let's say psychology. How about real estate? Yeah, I think, I, I think I'm, I'm going to use go 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 real estate psychology, license. and you're going to take two hundred thousand dollars in student loan. Does America need another million psychologists? Maybe not. So you say I don't have a job, and I have two hundred thousand dollars of student loans. On the other hand, 
if you study computer programming, and I'm not saying everybody says you be a computer programming, but there's lots of jobs. So they the future. So the Different. point is, there's one way. How do we make a living in today's environment? And second, what do we like to educate ourselves and learn and do everything else? So it requires understanding where the world is going and be better prepared, right? So it is disheartening when it happens to people we know, right? right? But the opportunity is there. For example, there was no such thing as supply chain management logistics. Now there's maybe 150,000 people in the Inland Empire that has these jobs. And Real tour, by the way. Real tour. It's my pet peeve. There's no real. Uh, we don't. We're not real uh, tours. Real tour. With my career, that these companies are trying to put, with all the data that they built that we provided to them, are trying to put realtors out of business, saying, "Well, now we have all this data that we've generated. We've yep. got the information from this." The, the, let, let me answer that. Let me answer that one. Um, so, do I have to change my career now? You might. To, into you might. This is the deal. Whether you have to change your career or I have to change my business model, or we all, I, I think what I hear, and one of the reasons I do this and I hang out with Ito or try to hang out with Ito and do this and all these other guys is because I, am in, I live in a constant state of fear as to where the business model is going. Okay? I'm trying to make those adjustments. Things are changing. And the scary part is they're changing really, really fast. Okay? And if we're not in a position to make those decisions and adjust accordingly, where well, there's going to be some discomfort. Some people are going to, to come out of this in maybe a worse off position, especially those of us that aren't taking a look at where things are going. I, I think my, the takeaway, not just with Edo, but just with all of these business things that I do generally speaking, is if you're standing still and you're not making some sort of changes in your business model, you're dead. You are absolutely dead. Okay, we're going to take one more question because we're, oh I my just want to say something to you um, to encourage you. There's a wave. I'm seeing it, so now it's, I'm good. I'm, I'm seeing it where it's going, so I have that further vision, which is good. You got to be ready for the change. The Another stupid example. Yeah. Who, who has a Dyson vacuum cleaner? Okay, well, if you are the supplier who makes the cord that goes from the vacuum cleaner to plug into the wall, and your only customer is Dyson, I think you're screwed. Because I just saw a commercial from Mr. Dyson yesterday or the day before that says, I've got the cordless vacuum cleaner, which is kind of cool, but no one wants to buy those because they suck, right? And he says, oh, and by the way, we're not making any corded vacuum cleaners anymore. Now, it's a silly example, but I'm like, oh, well, that's pretty cool. Dyson's going to, all of their vacuum cleaners starting at some point in the future aren't even going to have a power cord to them anymore. I, so I, if, if we are in the power cord business, we got a problem we better figure out how we can make batteries or do and, something and else. And I just want everybody to just sort of right, look at things in a different way. So we say Amazon is putting all these people out of business. They used to say that about Walmart. But Amazon and Walmart are not putting anybody out of business. You know who is putting out of business? We are. Yeah, the consumer. If you're buying an Amazon, you're saying I prefer to buy that way than to go to that store. That's right. So, the reality is, if you're somebody who says, I prefer to go to record stores. Oops. Oops. Right? Because most people are preferring to go to iTunes. So it's OK to say, to understand that we can't view the world only by what we like. We have to view the world, right, as a whole, and see what's happening. And once you realize what's happening, you can better prepare yourself and not find out about these things too much later. Right? You start preparing. If you think, for example, a lot of real estate will be automated, if you were a record store or a video store and you realize five years before that things are going to go to Netflix, maybe you sell your store, and maybe you invest in some real estate startups, maybe you invest in Netflix when it's cheap and early and right. you ride the wave. But those changes are like a wave. You're either going to be crushed by a wave or you're going to be a surfer. Yep. Right? Yeah, okay, let's, let's do this, because we're, we're, we're 36 minutes over. Um, Ito's super generous, so this is what we're going to do. 
I have four people with questions. We're going to take all four of them, but we got to do, uh, no, no, don't, don't do what Rose did. Okay, so you got. I have another 10 you, minutes. Okay, and he, Ito's got 10 minutes. So you got 30 seconds to answer your question. You got one minute to answer it. Let's take the four questions and we'll get out of here in, in, in seven and a half minutes. What you got? So uh, in the short to medium term, uh, where do you see the effect of the migration out of California, both uh, people and businesses due to the overregulation? And then if you have time to comment on the uh, quality of education here in California and how it's going to affect things moving forward. But. So uh, I think the days of Californians are not numbered, right? There's value in lifestyle we all value because we're here, right? People pay the high taxes, they want to live here, they fight the traffic because they have a choice. Somebody can move to Texas. But there's a lot of things here that we do like and we're willing to pay for it, just like somebody buys for one car or another car. If all you need is transportation, four wheels, you can buy a very inexpensive car. You like fancier stuff, you, you have a choice, and people choose that. So I think California will still be a choice because it's a good lifestyle for most people, obviously very many people. On education, it's very important. And I want to I wanna spend maybe three minutes of it because three. it's really a key. Okay. We're so gonna We're going to lose a couple questions. Go ahead. It has, it, the world is fundamentally changed because people don't realize it. It's jarring to some. But over the last 10,000 years, it's been the same. So over the last 10,000 years, through the agrarian industrial revolution, the way we created wealth, meaning right, quality of life, jobs, full economy, right, the way we created wealth was by adding value to natural resource. So we were wealthy in America because we had oil in Texas, timber in Washington, gold in California, coal in Ohio. We were natural resource rich and we had a wealthy and economy. And we grew to be the largest economy in the world. In those days, if you were in a country like Spain or England, you're on a little island, no natural resources, you can't create wealth. What do you do? So we figure out technology. We're going to build a navy. We'll build an armada. And we're going to go to South America and bring all the gold back home, all the natural resources back home. England was the best at it, right? the, big, the biggest navy. They went all over the world. The sun, the sun never set on the British Empire. We were a colony here. They went everywhere. They can get the natural resources back home because the way we created wealth was by adding value to natural resource. If you had one cow, you were OK. If you had 100 cows, you were a wealthier person. So for 10,000 years, it's the same. right? It also paralleled individual wealth. Who got wealthy in the old days? You open the paper, right? Rockefeller with oil, warehouser with timber. People were adding value to natural resources, got wealthy. But over the last 20 years, it's changed fundamentally after 10,000 years of literally being the same. And, there's, and that's, we create wealth by adding value to ideas, not natural resources, right? That means we got wealthy in America because we're high tech, the high tech boom. Apples and Google and Facebook and, right, Julia Packard and Dell computers, right? We added value to ideas, not natural resources. And because we did a lot of it in America, we had a robust economy, a lot of high-tech companies, a lot of employment in high-tech, right? We had a robust economy. It also paralleled individual wealth. Who got wealthy today? You don't open the paper and say, another guy find, found an oil field in Oklahoma. No, you have Facebook, Microsoft, Google, right? eBay, Amazon. These are all people are adding value to ideas, not natural resources. So if we create wealth, meaning national wealth, full employment, quality of life, lifestyle, by adding value to ideas, as well as individual wealth. Consequently, the most valuable natural resource an area possesses is its people, because people add value to ideas. We no longer can rely on natural resources. So that requires education, right? And so I grew up in a place where education was important. But it's not just education. You know, read the book and do the math. It's how you think. So I come from a country when I grew up, there wasn't much going on there. They give you a paper clip. They said, take this home, your assignment is to come back to class, make four products out of it. I don't care if you turn it into, you open up, make it a ring, make it a fish hook, making a needle. All of a sudden, from limited resources, you made several products. Then you put you in a team. And now, take the same and make products. So now you have four guys, you can make a little wheel, a little cart, you can make other things. You can't imagine how many products people would make from a string of 
little metal piece called a right. paperclip. Right. But it taught you how to think as well as teaching the math and teaching the other things. So we create wealth by adding value to ideas. And like you said, education has become very, very important because if you are not thinking, you're not creating anything. And in fact, I was asked to give a talk to the, uh, uh, the entire leadership of the Riverside County Education Office. Okay, yeah. So you had about 500 people, all the executives and all the principals and the members. And he gave me this stack of reports about the challenges in education. And I came and I said, you know, I didn't have to read those reports to realize that we have challenges in education. So I'll give you a clue. If you come to a country and one of the top rated television shows is called, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Yeah. We got challenges. But then I told them the problem we have, the challenges we have, is not education. It's entirely different. I say, I don't care if you go to the, your worst performing school, inner city schools, where only 5% of the kids graduate, go to college, become engineers, doctors, lawyers. They're reading the same book. If you read your math book, your English book, you graduate, any high school in the country, you can go to college and you become anything you want to be. And so why 5% of the kids graduate? Same teachers, same curriculum, same school, same inner city schools. I said the difference is, if you go to the homes of those 5% of the kids, there's an education culture at home. Yep. The parents are not saying go to work, they're saying go to school. Don't even think about work till you graduate. So unless we bring back education as a central core value of our culture, it's not gonna change. You can put a million dollar computer in front of every kid. If they don't study, if the home doesn't have a culture of education, they're gonna go to school and don't even know how to turn on the computer. So I told them what they had to do is take some of the money from education Go to Madison Avenue in New York where all the advertising agencies are. Marketing companies, they know how to sell anything. Uh, ice to Eskimos. Task them with bringing education back to be a core central value of our culture. And you'll see the economy, you see everything change. So you're right, education, more than any time else, is the natural resource that will create, and you see this all over the world. India, poor for thousands of years. What happens now? Education, they have no natural resources. So now education, they educate people, they have a high tech economy, yep. they have the biggest, their middle class is bigger than the entire United States population. Yep. Of course they have a billion and a half people, so even 20% have reached a middle class, which is still fairly low, that's 300 million people are living better than our entire population in the US. Right. And, they're, and, they're, and they're mostly tech? Is, is they're like, you know, they're, they're yeah. adjusting themselves to the new economy. Right. So the reality is that when you're aware of it and you realize education is the differentiating factor right. in the competitiveness globally, and fortunately we have a lot of good culture around it. We'll just have to dust off and, and change our view because we have good education, we got good schools, we got infrastructure for it. I mean, honestly, when we had to build a high school because of master plan communities, you know, high school today costs you 100 to 200 million dollars to build. Half the money is literally the football fields. <laughs> Where I come from, 200 million will be a result in right. university. Right. <laughs> Every classroom has air conditioning. You know what air conditioning when I grew up was in a classroom? Yeah. Open the window. It was called windows. Yeah. If you had two windows in two corners, you were right. in a great class. Right. How can we get into that class, right? <laughs> and yet. From those kind of schools, you had people with technology receiving Nobel Prizes. They, you know, the point is not the circumstance and not how much money you throw of it, the culture. So if we can change the culture, everything else follows. Yeah. If you want to study, you'll study by candlelight, right? Yep. So that's the big difference. Don't need to spend too much money. You're fixing education. Yeah. We need to figure out how to and make I don't education. And I don't know that we have that culture right now. I really don't. Um, Okay, I don't know that we can actually end on anything better than that, but I, I feel bad because the very first I'm hand... I'm willing, I got like you, five more minutes. Oh, so we're going to we're gonna, we're gonna be out of here in two. Well, okay. we're going to take 30 second question from Gil only because you were the first hand to come up with the question. So make it quick.
job to sustain the affordability to buy a home with 20 renters and some homeowners? What do you see the income that these new jobs are being created? Okay, can these jobs, can these people buy houses? So the answer is yes, but it's yes with a qualifier. If we keep making it more and more and more expensive to build a home in California, we put more and more and more regulation. You know, the EIR for the World Logistics Center was $23 million. Okay. Wow. But the EIR, the Environmental EIR. Impact and Report. And I could tell you, outside of some city staff, nobody read it. Right. 40,000 pages. So if we keep on making things more and more and more expensive, you'll never catch up, right? So when you say, where is the affordability? As soon as we get the affordability, we jack up prices, we raise interest rates, right? We never get the people there. So the answer is qualified. The jobs are being created. If you're making, let's say, that's medium wage. Everybody's sort of dual income today. If you're making 90,000 to 100,000, you ought to be able to afford a home in our region. But if you make the homes more and more and more expensive, right, we'll never get there. So collectively, politically and otherwise, People have to be aware that when, on the other hand, when somebody screams, well, regulate air quality. I'm not saying we should have bad air. But put rationale to all the issues, balance the needs of the environment with right, the needs of people such that we don't deteriorate things, but we approve them or improve them in a fashion that will allow people to have a lifestyle they can afford and live. Because if you're right. commuting four hours a day, Right? And you're spending your money. I want to show you one slide and we'll close with this. I actually thought we'll talk about housing. By the way, some things will make it more affordable. So I was talking about additive manufacturing. So in a 3D printed house? These are, they're actually uh, making simple houses. Right. Not fancy houses yet, but this is the beginning. And that's a 3D printed house? Yeah. Wow. So that's the beginning. Very simple shapes, but nonetheless, very quickly, without all the extra labor and everything else. Now you say, okay, well, what happened to construction workers? Well, somebody has to build these machines, program them, maintain them, engineer them. So you're going away from knowing how to mix concrete to maybe being an electromechanical technician, right? Different skills, but you have a job if all these machines show up, right? And, and also about the true cost of commuting. This is interesting, and you guys can see if my math correlates, you can go home and try it. But home values go down by approximately $5,000 per minute of commute time from a job center. So I did this graph, and I looked at, and it's a bit of a while ago, so prices have moved up now, so it's nice. But they moved up across all the communities. Yep. But if you look at $5,000, right? So if you look at Moreno Valley, at that time, the houses were about 235, and 90 minutes to Irvine. So what's 5,000 times 90? 450,000. You add up 450,000 to the 235, and medium price is 720. And you can go down to Corona. Corona is only 45 minutes away. You start a base. So every, I did that throughout the communities, and I can almost pinpoint the value of housing by the commute time to job center. Anybody take the toll road during peak hours from Riverside all the way in? It'll cost you, it'll okay. cost you 30 bucks now, and, one way. And this is what consumers don't know, yep. right? The IRS, a couple of years ago, now I think it's up to 54 cents, but they, uh, they, they, it's 51 cents a mile, right? Between gas, insurance, wear and tear on a car, and what you lose in the value. So in a dual commuting household, right, if they spend $50 on gas and insurance and car depreciation and everything else at the end, they're commuting for two years, two cars, dual income, they would have spent $260,000 in cash. Okay? Yep. And most 30-year-old couples today, right, 10 years into adulthood, don't even have $260,000 in the bank account. Just in 10 years of commuting. People don't realize what commuting really costs. Imagine that you have local jobs, and without them understanding it, over 10 years they have saved or they, or they spend at least locally or in a home, right? Extra income of $260,000 over 10 years. So I, I'll close this with this because it puts it. So in one of our big community forums, there's a guy who worked for Northrop for 30 years. 
to the Molino Valley. And I asked him, he said, what is your house? You know, why did you come here? He said, I can afford the houses. He bought a house 30 years ago. He just retired 30 right. years, enough of. And I said, well, what, uh, you commuted all these years? He says, yeah, I commuted for these last 30 years. I lived in Moino Valley, went to Norfolk in LA. And he says, what, what, what's, uh, what's your house worth today? He says, uh, this was a couple of years ago. It was $170,000. Mm. And I said, what did it cost you to commute on average every year? He says, well, I went on the way to LA. It's about 89 miles, almost 90 miles. He says, he figured between the gas, and some years, remember, gas was already a photo of the gallon. The most. So it cost me an average of $7,000 a year. He did this for 30 years. So I figured for him that he spent $420,000 commuting to be able to afford the $170,000. Yep. Yeah. So creating local jobs in whatever industry it is absolutely impacts housing and improves the wealth right, of people, the lifestyle, the retirement. That's why home ownership should be the way to go. But you need to have the jobs closer to home. So instead of spending $260,000 in cash on commuting, you build your wealth, yeah. you build your home without by right, having to stress and drive a right. two, three, four. Not even to mention quality of life and quality time with family and all the rest of that. Okay, aren't right. you glad we didn't keep Edo to 20 minutes at the market forecast? I mean, Ron, <laughs> ah. Anyway, um, thank you, my friend. Thanks, all right, friends. I wasn't expecting to go for nearly two hours, but um, I wasn't hey, either. But I know, but it's great stuff. So questions. anyway, you got to run. Thank yes. you so much. I owe you dinner and lunch and a few other things.